Okay, so last time we reviewed the, the pH calculations and then we got into, um, you know, some of the discussions on, on acid base and, and leading towards this idea of separations. And so we're trying to, again, separate an analyte uh, from the matrix or one analyte from other analytes. And so we're going to go through some general partitioning concepts. A lot of times our samples are trapped in a matrix that is really difficult to remove. And so we need to either extract it uh, from that matrix or digest the matrix, which is destroying the matrix. And acid digestion, of course, there's a, um, different kinds of acids that you can use. Um, that we used to use chromic acid because it would dissolve anything um, and it would oxidize things, um, making sure all the minerals were, were oxidized and you had cations and everything was soluble. But uh, the chromate is, uh, you know, the chromium hexachrome is, is carcinogenic. And so we wanted to get away from that. So um, another uh, good acid mixture is aqua regia. So it's a mixture of concentrated nitric acid and concentrated hydrochloric acid. <laughs> and boy, does it dissolve stuff. And it's scary looking too, because it starts to, it makes this red solution that, that like produces a toxic gas. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's pretty scary. Another one is called piranha solution. I can't spell, but. And that's sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide. And that again is, a, is an oxidizing solution. So it oxidizes metals and releases them and then it dissolves things and, and it attacks the matrix and breaks it down. Um, you can also add heat to these. And so a lot of times they have these special microwave ovens that are made for microwave digestion. So. So there's kind of an industrial power microwave oven and they come with these uh, really thick Teflon bottles. And so you can put your material in there, put in your acid and then put it in the, the microwaves go through the Teflon uh, and, and then they'll heat up the liquid inside. And they have a little vent on top. Um, and uh, but boy, you can really get hurt with microwave digestion because it can superheat the liquid. The first microwave oven we had as a kid. I mean, they were brand new when I was little, so that's kind of weird, isn't it? And uh, I was in elementary school, and uh, my after school I went over to a friend's house, um, and we would hang out, and watch TV, and cartoons, and stuff, play games, play video games, uh, and they got a microwave, so brand new. So his brother put an egg in there and turned it on. Yeah, and uh, he's sitting there watching the egg, and we're in watching cartoons, and we hear it go ding, you know, and he opens it up, and then we hear him start screaming. Well, it didn't do anything, so he opened it up, and then it exploded, and he had, like, boiling cooked egg all over his face, and that was all over the wall and everything. Of course, we laughed our heads off because because <laughs> he was picking the, like, burnt egg off his face, and he had all these little red blisters. Like, <laughs> he looked like he had chicken pox. It was great. <laughs> you know, friends do that. They laugh at you when you hurt yourself. <laughs> I can tell you all have friends like that, too. <clears throat> and we can also do partitioning by uh, vapor, you know, headspace. You can drive things out of the liquid. Um, we did this on a fatty acid, uh, like bio digestion. We were up in the panhandle. I did a lot of work with uh, folks in ag. And so we were using uh, feedlot manure and, and putting it in this big, huge plastic um, cover and letting it generate methane. And so we were analyzing the fatty acids in those solutions. and. and you would have this solution of, of liquid that you pulled off of this manure, which was pretty smelly, right? And then as soon as you put an acid in there, you protonated all those fatty acids, and now they were less soluble in water, and they just flew into the headspace, which means the smell of that compound, just, the, that solution went through the roof, one drop of acid, and all of a sudden it was like 10 times more powerful. 
So we were injecting that gas directly into the GC and getting an analysis of those gases. So we're, what we're using is Routes Law and Henry's Law. And so <clears throat> you could do this, like in this case, ethanol uh, in, in this uh, aqueous solution, because uh, it's more volatile, you warm it up, the ethanol goes into the gas phase, and you could take that gas in a gas syringe and directly inject it into a gas chromatograph. We were doing this with fatty acids. So Routes Law is the uh, is the um, gives you the vapor pressure of the um, of pretty much of the of the solvent, and then Henry's Law gives it of the analyte, the thing that's dissolved in that solvent. So. There's another way you can separate things. You can put them in an organic and an inner uh, or aqueous phase. Um, solutions together. So you can use a separate separatory funnel and you can have something that's preferable in terms of the organic or, or uh, lipophilic, which is fat loving. It would be in the octanol phase. Mm -hmm. yep. right, or something that, that is water loving, you know, hydrophilic. And so we can just shake that and things will separate into their various um, layers. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today is liquid-liquid extraction. So we're going to really focus in on using Le Chatelier's taxi, acid-base equilibria, to drive things into or out of the aqueous phase. And it can go in, in either direction. So what we're going to do, this is a problem from the text, Propose a liquid-liquid extraction scheme to separate a sample containing naproxen sodium and codeine HCl. Okay. Now, before we, we go into getting information, in these names, I want you to start to recognize certain things. So we, here we have naproxen. If you look at the bottle, you'll see naproxen sodium a lot of times on the bottle. What is that telling you? You have... You have this naproxen mixed with this, this cation sodium. So what does that tell you about naproxen? It's negatively, it's negatively charged. If we've made a, a substance that's going to be neutral and it's paired with a cation, it has to be an anion. So uh, anion, cation. So what things in aqueous solution form anions? So if I have a substance and it's in an aqueous solution, how if, if how can I make it an anion? What's the most common way? You remove a proton. You take away a positive charge and there's a negative charge left behind. So what does that tell you about naproxen? It donated a proton, right? It's an acid. So this is an acid. So if you see something sodium, that something is an acid. Is that cool? Yeah, it's in the name. So you don't even need to look that up. You see naproxen sodium, you know naproxen is an acidic compound. Okay. And then whenever you see this, codeine HCl. You see this a lot. You look at the bottle of your cold medicine, you'll see things like this. I forget which ones they are, like dextromethorphine HCl or something like that. Um, so this is codeine HCl. What what is this telling us? It's yeah, that's right. You're going to guess it's a gate base. But think about the HCl. So this is a positive. This is a negative, right? And this positive, that, that proton has been added to codeine. So it's a base. It's accepted a proton. So it's a base. And it's a neutral base that has accepted a positive proton. It's been protonated. And so in order to get this to be a, a solid, a neutral solid, we have to put a counter ion in there. Just like we did for the, for the anion of the acid, we had to put a counter ion. The acid was negative, and we added the sodium positive to make a neutral salt, and then we, we have that salt. And that's what we can then make crystals of and 
put it into a formulary and make it make a medicine. Same thing here. We have a base that's a neutral base, like an amine. We protonate the amine, and then we have a counter ion to make it a salt so that it can be formulated. So this is codeine HCl. So it's been protonated, and then the counter ion is the Cl. Okay, so step one is to get more information. That's what we have. We have naproxen, which is an acid, and we have the um, codeine HCl, which is a base. You see it's been protonated here, and then we have the counter ion, the Cl, which may be near there. We don't know where that is, but it's just showing you the formula with the Cl stuck on there somewhere um, nearby. Okay. Now we can get lots of more information. We could get the solubility and so on. Where are we going to get the solubility of these drugs? The Merck Index. Oh my gosh. Okay, so you've seen the CRC, right? It's about this thick and it has an enormous amount of information in it, but it doesn't have uh, um, it doesn't have things like solubility for all of these drug type compounds. This is made by Merck Pharmaceutical Company and they, this was for their scientists to have all of the different substances and, and their solubilities and their PKAs and everything like that. So for dealing with drugs, um, drugs of abuse and pharmaceutical drugs, the Merck Index is a really great reference. And so I, was, I would go online and find a used copy or something that somebody's trying to sell and buy one. Just so you have it if you're interested in this kind of stuff. And so from the Merck, we can get the PKAs for these, the, the acid and the PKA of the protonated base. We can get the log P values, which are that uh, water octanol partition coefficient, the, you know, the base 10 logarithm of that. Um, and, uh, and so this is, um, and then we could determine the water solubility, the ethanol, the chloroform, the ether. And so what we want is we want to have an aqueous phase and an organic phase. And so here, this is saying this, this uh, naproxen is insoluble, at least in the acid form, in, in water. And um, codeine is pretty soluble in water. That's one gram to 20 grams. So by mass, one to 20 grams. So, um, so I would say one gram of codeine to 20 grams of water. You go, you go to like, if you try to put it in less than 20 grams of water, it won't, you know, it'll be saturated. So this is sort of the saturation point. Um, it's less soluble in ethanol, one to one, no, yeah, one to 180. So you have 180 grams of ethanol and it would be saturated. 800 grams of chloroform and it would be saturated. Yeah. So yeah, you need 800 grams of chloroform to dissolve one gram of codeine, whereas you need 20 grams of water. So yeah. So this is the biggest difference here. So codeine is not very soluble in chloroform and naproxen sodium is soluble in chloroform. So it be, seems pretty easy to get the naproxen to go into chloroform and the codeine to go in water. Okay, so that would be a great solvent to choose to pair with our aqueous phase. So you want an organic phase and an aqueous phase. What's the organic phase? That's what we're trying to determine here. Probably wouldn't be good to use ethanol because ethanol and water are miscible. So they're not gonna make two phases. So even if ethanol would give you a big difference, you're not gonna get an ethanol water extraction to work because ethanol and water are mixed with each other in all, in all proportions. So you need to go with chloroform or ether or hexane or something like that, yeah. Uh, what did you say this was like doing? So like if we have a, um, let's say we have a tablet or a powder or something that has these drugs in it and we wanna get them apart. So we could quantify the naproxen separately from the, from the codeine. Yeah, and so, you know, let's say the codeine may be the, the, the drug of abuse, so we really don't care how much naproxen is in there because there are no regulations on that, but there is on the opioid. So if we could just run this through a liquid-liquid extraction scheme and then analyze the codeine, then we don't have to worry about the naproxen interfering with our analysis. And so let's look at these exploitable differences. Okay, so on the left, at low pH, remember low pH, we have lots of protons.
And at high pH, we don't have any protons, okay? We've sucked them all out of the solution. So at pH below 4.2, these are the species that we have. And so I'm gonna call this one N. And I'm gonna label this one CH plus. Does that make sense? Codeine HCl, CH plus. And so up here, I'm gonna, let's see. Let me make sure I get the, um, the pK is right. Okay, so the naproxen sodium is the 4.2, okay. So at low pH, this is N right here. And the codeine, since we're below the, the 8.2, is CH+. So do you see my up here on this little square, I've made a, like a pH plot. Across the bottom axis is pH. And then I've drawn some vertical lines at the pKa's. So this is the pKa equals 4.2 for the naproxen. And this is the pKa equals 8.2 for the codeine. And so we're using those pKa's to tell us how to do this liquid-liquid extraction scheme. Then at pH is above 8.2, this is what I have. So here I have the N minus. Okay. Actually, since this is an acid, I'm going to put an H in front of it. That's what I typically do. Okay, so I call that HN. And then when it's deprotonated, I call it N minus. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then up here, I have the codeine and the protons removed, so it's neutral. So I just have C neutral. So that's why I call this pH speciation. What are the species related to the pH scale? And if you can do that, then you can look to see where things are in the aqueous phase and where things are in the organic phase. Okay, and so the charged things here, this has a minus charge, this oh, plus charge, this has a minus charge. Those are aqueous, they're water soluble. And in general, if it's neutral, these are organic molecules, they're gonna be in the organic phase. So can you tell that I, I want to avoid that region between 4.2 and 8.2? Because they would both be in the aqueous phase and I wouldn't get any kind of separation. So I either want to be in an acidic solution that's, that's a pH lower than 4.2 because then the, the codeine HCl will be in the aqueous phase and the naproxen sodium will be in the organic phase. Even though it's not very soluble in the... No, no, it was it was soluble in the organic phase. So that would be a good good side to be on. If I was on the above 8.2, then the codeine would be trying to get into the organic phase and the, the naproxen sodium anion would be in the aqueous phase. So in basic solution, I could do separation. In acidic solution, I could do separation. In neutral, I really couldn't because in a neutral solution, I would have everything in the aqueous phase. So let's take a let's take a top hat on that one and discuss this. So what are we? Okay, so what phase will the codeine and the proxim be in at neutral pH? I hope I didn't screw this up. I made this question quickly and I'm looking at it and I'm like, uh-oh, I can't remember which question, which answer I put is right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will, but I, I don't want to confuse you by having the wrong answer be kind of correct. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. So I'm really nervous right now. Yeah, I think I got the two things. I got the PKA swapped on them. I think I did. <laughs> okay. One person waiting on one person. All right, we're good. Okay, and the suspense is killing me. Where's the answers? <laughs> okay, very good. That's correct. Yeah, because it's right there in the middle, and those aqueous pieces overlap with each other. Okay, so um, y'all close your eyes. I want to check something. <laughs> yeah, see, I screwed it up. I got uh, yeah. Y'all did great. <laughs> hey, okay. Now make sure that the numbers are correctly counted for you. Yeah. All right, so let's go back here. Again, this these log P values tell you about that octanol to, to uh, water coefficient. Now, we're not dealing with octanol, but still octanol is kind of a stand-in for all the organic phases. And, and so if you had that oct octanol water co partition coefficient, you could um, know that the um, that the naproxen is, is much more soluble in an organic phase than it is, uh, than the codeine is. And so you could calculate the solubility, but uh, we're just, I mean, we're going to just do the best we can with the phases that we choose. And in here, uh, in this case, for that chloroform uh, partition coefficient, we have the solubility of naproxen and chloroform, which is 1 to 15. And it says it was insoluble in water, so we could put a zero there. So it's essentially infinitely soluble in in the chloroform. So the naproxen is going to prefer to be in the chloroform. And then the, the same thing for chloroform versus water for the codeine HCl. Um, codeine HCl in terms of chloroform is 1 over 800 and water is 1 over 20. So you do that ratio, you get 0 0.025. And so it's going to really prefer to be in the, in the water. You put in the separatory funnel, do the shake, and you vent it and shake and vent, and then you're ready to separate when you pull the the organic phase off, that's where the naproxen goes, and then the codeine. And so this is a, you can do this multiple times. In fact, you can separate all of these different things with uh, with five steps. And so, you know, if you have a huge unknown sample, um, you could take the pH to less than two and extract. And so the pH, remember, we're dealing with the aqueous phase. And so if you're you're, we're changing the pH of the aqueous phase. And so the organic in this case, you could just choose a ether or, um, or chloroform. And, and so you make the acidic layer, uh, the aqueous layer acidic, a uh, pH two, and then the acids and neutrals will go to the organic phase. The acids will be protonated. That's why they'll be neutral. And the neutral compounds will go over to the organic phase and your bases, because they're um, the uh, protonated bases will be positive. And then the water soluble compounds will go into the aqueous phase. So we separate those two. Now we have two more pHs. So how do we get that? Well, when we separate them, we have to take the organic phase and we add a fresh layer of water to it. And so then we make that layer of water pH 6. So this is a pH 6 of fresh water. Okay. So we pull that organic phase off, add more water at a pH of 9 shake and shake and then the uh since it's neutral you have some aqueous um, strong acids and um which are you know deprotonated they've donated their protonated proton protons because they're stronger uh, at ph6 and then uh also some other kinds of um, compounds and then the organic still has the neutrals and the weak acids so we pull the organic phase off add fresh water And in this case, we make that water pH 10 or greater, and then we can separate the organic um, neutrals and the aqueous weak acids. Then we take that aqueous phase and add fresh organic. 
And then we change that. Um, uh, so here we go. We've got the aqueous phase. Here now we have to change the pH to, since we're using that aqueous phase, we have to add base to the aqueous phase and test its pH. So you don't want to overshoot. If you use a strong base in this case, um, you can overshoot real easily. As soon as you titrate with that strong base, just slightly past the pH 2 and you run out of acid, it shoots up to pH 11. And so you want to use a, a base that's going to be more controllable to get you to pH 9. Um, okay, and so that fresh organic phase, you change the pH of the aqueous extract, and then, then you can add more of the strong base, like sodium hydroxide, add in a fresh organic phase, and extract, and then you end up with your strong bases and your aqueous metals and water solubles. So, this is sort of a universal extraction scheme. You probably won't have an, an unknown with all six of these categories in it, but this is a way you can use liquid-liquid extraction to separate six different types of analytes. Um, it's a lot of work and you use a lot of solutions. So you would do that for large volumes of analytes. Most of the time we're dealing with microscopic or trace analysis of analytes and so that we use chromatography. There's different kinds of chromatography. Um, you've studied this uh, or will study it in, uh, in instrumental. And so you have that partition liquid chromatography. Here's uh, one of the main points that I want you to know when we talk about normal or reversed phase. So if you don't memorize this, you have no hope of knowing what normal is, right? So normal phase is a polar stationary phase. So that's a main point there. And then reverse phase is a nonpolar stationary phase. So how does this work? Well, you have some sort of support with a stationary phase on it. And past that support is your solvent or mobile phase. and your analytes will interact with the stationary phase and kind of get drugged behind based on how much they interact with it. And so if you have a polar stationary phase and you have a polar analyte, it's gonna interact with the stationary phase more and it's gonna come out slower, okay? Uh, sometimes it comes out too slow. So if you have organic acids and they hydrogen bond to the stationary phase, it takes too long to get them out. Okay, so a lot of times we derivatize them. We, we, put, we take the acid proton off and we put a, some other organic or fluorinated thing on there so that it comes out faster. It still interacts with the polar stationary phase, but it doesn't stick. And so we don't want to get our compounds stuck on the stationary phase. It takes 15, 20 minutes or an hour to get them out. By that time, your peaks have broadened so much that it's almost undetectable. Uh, sometimes that's why we switch to nonpolar stationary phases. Uh, then you have adsorption uh, liquid chromatography, which is the molecules not really using polar attractions, but just dispersion terms. They just they just stick to the um, to the stationary phase. Then you have ion exchange. So if you have your stationary phase, and it has a lot of times they use SO3 molecules or, or functional groups. And so then your cations will get stuck on here. So if you're trying to say separate calcium, uh, you know, it'll get stuck on that stationary phase and, and then your anions will go past and then they'll have um, other stationary phases that filter out the, the anions. And so you have a ion exchange column that separates the cations and an ion exchange column that separates the cations. A size exclusion just has pore sizes and your polymers get stuck in these pores. And so there the, 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 um, the big polymers come out first and the small polymers come out last because they get stuck more often. Then gas chromatography, your mobile phase is just the gas, the carrier gas flowing through instead of a liquid. And and it step, separates things based on adsorption or on polarity. And again, it's, it's based on gases, so you need to have things that have boiling points less than 150 C. And then this newer technique, supercritical fluid uh, chromatography, uses supercritical CO2. 
mainly because it's cheap and its pressure ranges are, are manageable. Um, we could do supercritical fluids of other types of molecules, but they'd be more expensive and CO2 is pretty cheap and it's pretty clean. And it's a good solvent. When you get it into the self supercritical range, it's, uh, it's a really good organic solvent. So then we have um, sort of exploratory chromatography. I'll, that's what I kind of I call thin layer chromatography, exploratory. As opposed to preparatory. So exploratory, you have a substance, you dissolve it in a, say, an ether, you pull one drop of that, and you put it onto a thin layer chromatography plate, and then you put it in contact with the liquid, and this liquid here, so you put your dot here, you mark a line where it started, and then that liquid starts to elute that dot and move that dot up. So the, the eluent is the mobile phase, this aluminum oxide plate is the stationary phase. It's a glass plate with aluminum oxide on top and it separates the compounds based on polarity. So the least polar will go faster than the more polar. And so it separates this. Sometimes you have colored substances and it can separate the colored substances and it's really satisfying. You see the colors separate. Um, other times you just have like yellow spots. You know, so organic compounds absorbing the UV and a little bit of the blue will appear yellow. And so you have this bright white aluminum oxide and you see some yellow spots on there. Uh, you can shine a black light or a UV light on this and some of these spots will fluoresce. And so sometimes you don't even see a spot and you shine a, a UV light on there and you see this fluorescent spot on here. And so then you carefully get a pencil and you draw a little mark around it. Okay. And then you have this solvent front. It's inside a chamber and the solvent's moving up. And as soon as you pull it out of the chamber, the solvent starts to evaporate. So you don't know how far the solvent went. So while it's in the chamber, you kind of have to look at the, the side, you know, and nothing's perfect. So you'll see little defects or something at the white powder on this glass. And you say, okay, there's a nice clean spot right there. And that's where my solvent front stopped. So when I pull it out, I'm gonna make a pencil mark there. And so you make a pencil mark where that solvent front was. And then this ratio, if this is one, then that's what, like 0 0.8? And that's 0 0.6? And this is maybe point, 0.4? And those are repeatable numbers. That's why you want to mark the solvent front. So the ratio of travel to the solvent front is a repeatable number. So if you have your three dots, that's fine. You found three compounds, but go ahead and mark their proportional elution so that you can say it was the dot at 0.4 elution rate um, that was the yellow one and the red one was at 0.6 and the blue one was at 0.8, okay, relative to the solvent front. And that also is repeatable for some other people. You know, if they have a different size plate, maybe theirs is longer, it'll still be in proportion. So that point 0.8 will work on your data and on theirs, and you can predict, and they can use your data. Um, now, preparatory chromatography is separating things by eluding them through a column of alumina packing. So this aluminum oxide stationary phase. So you pack this column. Down here, you have this little um, tube that comes out. You could, again, use a UV light. You could have some of the kinds of detectors, and then you could just have your beakers here. And when, you know, fraction number one, the blue fraction comes out, you collect it in a beaker, set it aside, then the red one comes out, you set it aside, then there's nothing for a while, and then the yellow one comes out, you set it aside. So this is a way, again, to separate your uh, compounds. Now they make these, they go on the ends of syringes. It's pretty cool. So you have this kind of little prep columns, you pull in your sample, you put the syringe on or the, 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 um, the prep column that has alumina in it, and you carefully squeeze the liquid through and it will trap some compounds and let other compounds through. And if there's time, we'll watch a video on that. So. Now, 
This is uh, the last one we'll talk about. And this one is using the skills of biochemistry. Um, the sort of antibody antigen complex has been really fantastic in terms of making tests and separation techniques. Um, so this uh, antibody binds with an antigen and forms this antibody antigen complex. And it, it's again, using enzymes in their pockets. It's very much like a key and a lock. And so it's very specific, just like a key uh, and a lock are very specific. And so you can use this. Now there's a bunch of different ways to set these tests up. In this case, we might have a drug here and an, and an antibody that has um, got a pocket that will hold on to that drug. And then if there's no drug there, we have this, um, this sort of standard that's part of the test that has an enzyme that will uh, interact with the colored substrate or clear substrate to make it colored. And so we can, we can take our, our sample, we can put it into these little plates, and we can fill all of the spaces with the, with the drug if the drug is in our sample. And then we wash that out, and then we put in this um, uh, test solution that has the drug uh, that's tied or coupled to this enzyme, and it will fill the remaining seats. So we have all these little enzyme uh, antibodies stuck to the bottom of the plate. We put the sample in there, and there's, you know, if there's drugs in the sample, then it'll fill all the chairs. If there's only a little bit of drug, it'll fill some of the chairs. And then there's some chairs open, and then we put in the thing that's gonna cause the color change in the remaining chairs and then we test it. And we can, we can see then if there's a lot of drugs in the sample, then it's clear. If there's no drugs in the sample, then it's colored. And so this is a way to get a color change. And there's lots of these little tinker toys of antibodies and enzymes and analytes, and they, they make all kinds of different versions of this. And so there's no one way to make this ELISA test, this enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay uh, but this is how, how uh, we do the pregnancy tests or keto pee strips, all these little test strips that you pee on and test your urine. They have these kinds of color changing um, antibody complexes that are looking for hormones or for other kinds of things in your urine. And that's how the COVID tests work. So I went ahead and found a video that is an animation of the COVID test. And that's what's going on here. Um, so here's a good video. Let's see. Let me go ahead and pause the this one though, so we don't